Hello, and welcome to Lecture 30, the final lecture in Chapter 8, covering the final section in Chapter 8, that being 8.6, and the topic of angular momentum. All right, so this has been the last of our lectures of a rather dense chapter. So I hope you stayed with me on this journey through all of these rotational topics. And here we are covering our last angular or rotational idea, momentum. Okay, all right, well, let's get to the the one key term here, and that is the law of conservation of angular momentum. Okay, so this is the third conservation law. Okay, why is it the third? Well, what are the other two? Well, to remind you, the other two conservation laws you've seen so far are energy and translation momentum. And those are the three, the big three conservation laws of mechanics, energy, translation momentum, and angular momentum. Okay, and of course, we're gonna to have to define what angular momentum is, so this, the law of conservation of angular momentum states that the angular momentum of a system remains constant whenever the sum of external torques is zero. Well, that sounds an awful lot like the law of conservation of momentum, which was just plain old translation momentum. That one, that one would have said states that the momentum of a system remains constant whenever the sum of external forces is zero. All right. So all we've done is just replace the word momentum with angular momentum and replace the word forces of torques. But we've kind of got used to that, right? Everything we've moved over from translation and rotation is just, oh, replace A with alpha, replace F with tau, replace M with I. All right. You get the idea. Okay. So what is it applicable to? When are we going to use the law of conservation of angular momentum? Well, for angular collisions, so when things collide and rotate, or maybe when two rotating things collide, and for rotating objects that change their shape. And that's pretty specific to when we'd use conservation of angular momentum, which is different than when we'd use conservation of momentum, because changing shape doesn't have any effect, because when we were talking about angular momentum, or excuse me, when we were talking about translational momentum, shape wasn't a factor. It was particles, effectively. Even if we called them bullets or cars or, or whatever it may be, or balls crashing into each other, they, weren't, they didn't have a center of mass, they didn't have a radius, they just behaved like particles. So there was, there, was not, there was no shape to change. But of course, now that we've been introduced to the moment of inertia, I, you know, in this idea that it's mr squared, at least for a simple pendulum or a hoop, or it's some other thing, like for a cylinder, it's one half mr squared, right? So if you change your shape, you change your distribution of mass, that means you change your I. And it turns out when you change your inertia, your momentum must follow suit. Okay, or in other words, your momentum remains constant and something else must compensate for the change in inertia. What is that something else? Let's see. Okay, so first of all, we're going to look at a law, Newton's second law. Wait, didn't we just see Newton's second law? We did. We just saw that tau net equals I alpha. All right, that's what we saw. We saw Newton's second law and we saw that in the torque form, quote unquote. Well, this is, this is Newton's second law in the angular momentum form. This is the fourth and final time we will see Newton's second law, all right? So we're all about kind of the last here. We're definitely uh, ending a chapter, you know, more of a figurative chapter here, right? We've come to the third and final conservation law. We've come to the fourth and final expression of Newton's second law, right? We're really bringing ideas together. This is a real, this is a, this is a moment in the class where we, we have accumulated a large amount of fundamental ideas. But we should say what the law states. It has net torque, right? Very much like Newton's second law in, you know, the, the torque, the angular acceleration form. Um, but then look what it's equal to. It's equal to the change in L over the change in T. Well, what's L? L is angular momentum, all right? Now compare this form of Newton's second law, this angular momentum form of Newton's second law to the translational form of, of Newton's second law, which this just stated that F net equal delta P over delta T. Recall that one? Okay, so look at the comparison. We've just replaced F with tau, and we've replaced P for translational momentum with L for angular momentum, okay? So L is angular momentum, okay? Delta T is obviously change in time. Okay, so how do we define angular momentum? Well, there's two actual ways to define it, and that, that wasn't so much the case with translational momentum. It was always just P, translational momentum, equal mass times velocity, okay? And that's also gonna be true, or something similar is gonna be true, for rotational systems which are solid objects. So for solid objects, angular momentum L is gonna be equal to I omega. And again, that's very much like P equaling MV because I is inertia, just like mass is, M is, 
and omega is angular velocity instead of rotational velocity, or excuse me, instead of translational velocity. It's hard not to get tongue-tied in all these terms, right? So this is L equals I omega. This is just the definition of angular momentum. And it also tells us something interesting about its units, right? Because we know that the moment of inertia is kilogram meters squared, because it's mass times distribution of mass, and then angular momentum is radians per second. So that tells us that, ang that angular momentum is kilogram meters squared per second, okay? Which are not the same units as plain old momentum, all right? Plain old momentum was kilogram meters per second. So there's an extra, there's an extra meter in angular momentum. It's kilogram meters squared per second. And that's kind of like how where angular, iner or, um, angular inertia, um, rotational inertia, or the moment of inertia is kind of like plate old mass, translational inertia, but it's got that extra m squared tacked onto it because it's not just the mass, it's where the mass is located. Likewise, for angular momentum being kilograms, meters squared per second, that extra meter, the fact that it's meters squared, is because the distance matters, the moment r matters for the calculation of angular momentum. Now, another interesting thing about angular momentum is that we can express it as joule seconds. And this is my favorite expression, expression for the units of angular momentum, just like I like to talk about translational momentum having units of newton seconds, units of newton seconds, all right? So because th that way you can really kind of see that one is just joules times time and the other is force times time, okay? So this is angular momentum. And this expression of just taking I times omega is great for things like disks, if I wanted to find the angular momentum of a disk, if I wanted to find the angular momentum of a sphere, then I would simply take the eye of the sphere and the angular velocity of the sphere, and there we go. That would be the angular momentum of the sphere. And it's kind of the same idea. Objects at rest don't have angular momentum, they, and the greater the velocity, in this case the angular velocity, the greater the momentum. But in this case, the angular momentum. Okay? All right. So that's angular momentum for solid objects. But you can also talk about angular momentum of particles, which might seem weird because we couldn't go the other way. We can't talk about the angular, um, or the, um, I mean, let me put it this way, we can't talk about the translational momentum of something that is a solid rotating object, because if it's not translating, it simply doesn't have translational momentum. But it turns out that every object that's translating has angular momentum. Well, how's that? Well, consider an object, a particle, that's translating with some velocity v. You might think, oh, well, in that case, it's angular momentum is just p equals mv, and you'd be, you'd be right. But now what if you want to consider that velocity relative to some point, some origin? Well, now that I'm considering the velocity vector of this object relative to some origin, now it's suddenly an angular momentum because now I have a moment arm, a distance from the origin to the location of the particle with mass m, and now its rotation, or I should say now its translation, is like a rotation because at that moment in time, it's like it's exerting a torque, an imaginary torque, if you will, relative to some pivot point. And it doesn't have to be a true pivot point. It can just be some location, some origin on an axis. So in that respect, everything has angular momentum. Because if I'm walking across a room and I say, oh, I'm walking due north, but then I look at the corner of that room, it's as if I'm rotating about the corner. Okay? And you know, it's, it's kind of an odd idea, but it does, but it's useful because it does allow us to express the angular momentum of any object, even those that are just translating, all right? And when we do that, when we express the angular momentum of translating objects, it, it, we have angular momentum is just translational momentum times r. Because again, here's our vector, our momentum vector, here is some origin, here is the r vector, and there you have it. Angular momentum is just p times r. So p, and the particle would be located right there, mass m, right? So p is its is its mass times velocity, and then r is the distance to the, the current location of that particle from some origin, usually a pivot point, okay? So that's angular momentum of a particle, p times r, and then obviously p, translational momentum, is just m times v. So that means that for translating objects, angular momentum can be expressed as mv times r, as long as there's a well-defined r, as long as there's some pivot point or origin from which you're measuring r from. If there's not, then there's, there'd be no, it'd make no sense to express the angular momentum of a translating object, okay? Rotational mass, okay? And then here I'm just uh, making the comparison that I already did. Okay, so you have it there in your notes, all right? And here this relates transla uh, translation to angular momentum. Okay, you see it nicely, okay? And an interesting caveat here, an extra thing that I haven't mentioned, and let me show this, this next point here. So angular momentum translating objects, as I said. Let's consider this v right here, this velocity. Well, that is the, the component of velocity that is perpendicular to the moment arm. 
to the radius because r is the moment arm it's just the distance from the pivot or the origin and now in many many cases v the entire velocity will be perpendicular so you don't have to worry about taking a component only in the very most challenging problems you can see in this class would you have to worry about taking a component of v finding the component of v relative to r for the most part it'll be perpendicular all the examples here in the notes it will be perpendicular so you won't have to worry about the fact that really this is v sine theta where sine theta is the angle between v and r all right so truly it would be l equals m v r sine theta where theta is the angle between v and r okay all right now finally we got us started on this whole, this whole topic of defining momentum and relating it to things like torque and moment of inertia and, tra and uh, rotational velocity and mass and translational velocity and distance from some pivot. What started this whole journey was the fact that it was conserved because that's, what, that's mostly why we care about angular momentum is like momentum, it's a conserved quantity. And this right here is the conservation law. It's a simple statement. Just like when we state that, that translational momentum is conserved, it's just P equals P prime. And I'm just using the same notation, L being the initial angular momentum, and then L with the little accent mark um, uh, expresses L prime being the final angular momentum. So initial, final. You could write it as initial and final, like that. All right? And the idea is angular momentum is conserved whenever the net torque is equal to zero. All right? Great. We'll use that to solve problems. All right? Well, let's do it. All right. So we got four types of problems that I want to show you here in this set of notes. Type one. Simple problems that involve conservation of angular momentum, angular momentum when the moment of inertia of a, sim, of a single object changes. Okay, definitely. That sounds like a, a, pro, a problem we can tackle. Okay, type two. Problems that involve the collision of a fluid in translational motion with an object free to rotate. Okay, oh, this is kind of interesting. This, is, this really reminds me of the water wheel, right? Because remember we had the, the water wheel and we were looking at, the, con, at the, uh, the collision. It wasn't a conservation problem, but it was the collision of, of uh, translational momentum of the water and the change in the translational momentum of the water and how that, how that then resulted in a force being exerted on the wheel, okay? So it's going to be like that, but looking at it in perhaps a more accurate way, looking at, as an, looking at that whole process as an angular phenomenon, okay? All right, but we're still, but it's going to be a fluid. And, and if, if, you're, if you're having a hard time recalling the uh, an example I'm referring to, it's one where you have a mass flow rate, kilograms per second, okay? And then finally, type three, problems that involve the perfect, perfectly inelastic collision between two rotating objects where the collision is along the axis of rotation. So this is like dropping a spinning disc onto another spinning disc, right? Imagine you, you, know, you got like a, 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 like a turntable and it's spinning and then you, you, maybe you start spinning another disc in the opposite direction and then just let it fall. And so it falls right on top of the other, okay? And then you want to find out how fast are they spinning now that they've, they've landed and stuck together. Okay, now does it have to be perfectly inelastic? No, but it always will be in this class. Okay, and finally type four, fairly complex problems that involve the collision of an object in translation with an object that is free to rotate and energy conservation may fall in um, those types of problems. So this is type four is the only type where you're really gonna have to consider the angular momentum of a translating object and that's where you use the equation MVR, okay, for L. All right, let's look at our first simple one. A problem that involves conservation of angular momentum angular momentum when the moment of inertia changes, okay? Well, the most classical example of this is an ice skater because when an ice skater pulls in their arms, we all know what happens. The ice skater starts spinning faster. So this is an ice skater, it's already spinning, right? They're spinning in some slow arc, their arms are out, they pull their arms in and all of a sudden they, they start doing that fast spin, okay? That is the absolute textbook example of conservation of angular momentum, okay? But let's calculate it. So an ice skater has a moment of inertia, just some, some, you know, kind of because they're a complicated shape, I'm just giving you a value here, 0.519 kilogram times meter squared. And they are spinning at a constant angular velocity of 45 RPM. They pull their arms into their body and decrease their moment of inertia to 7.04 times 10 to the negative two. Significant decrease in their moment of inertia. And th these are fairly accurate numbers. I tried to look up the most accurate numbers I could. How fast will they be spinning at this point? Okay, so we'll use conservation of angular momentum. We're just gonna have L initial equals L final. So initial angular momentum, final angular momentum. Okay, again, I don't know why it's L for angular momentum. I don't know why it's P for momentum, okay? But the L is the letter we use for angular momentum. Okay, this is a solid object, so it's gonna be I omega, okay? That this is the initial moment of inertia and the initial rotational velocity. And then we have the final moment of inertia and the final rotational velocity, all right? 
Okay, and then again, this is kind of interesting because we never had mass change in our momentum problems, okay? And, but here, it's kind of like we're having mass change, but we're just having shape change, which then, of course, affects rotational mass, the moment of inertia. How so? Well, let's see. Well, since it just I changed, and I gave you both the values of I, it's rather simple. We just isolate omega naught, um, excuse me, omega prime, the final angular velocity, and then we plug in all of our known values, because we know the initial moment of inertia, we know the reduced moment of inertia, the final one, and then we know the initial angular velocity. It was given to us in 45, uh, in RPMs, there's 45 RPMs. We don't really need to convert it over to radians per second. You can, but I just decided to leave it in RPMs. And there we have it, 332 RPMs. So as a ratio, we could think about how much faster they're going. And they're going about six times faster, actually about seven times faster, okay? All right, so rotational rate is seven times faster. Conservation of angular momentum by just changing the moment of inertia. Okay, so let's do that water, water type, the fluid type example. Water drives a water wheel, um, and here's the mass. It was meant to be included in the problem. I just left it out, but here it is retroactively added in there. Um, and the radius of the water wheel is given as well, two meters, okay? That'd be the radius, okay? All right, the water enters the wheel with a speed of V1, be over here, all right, I'll add that to the, the figure here, and drives the water with a speed, um, or exits the water, water wheel with a speed of V2, so the, the speed is reduced, all right? The water passes through the water wheel with a mass flow rate of 62 kilograms per second, all right? What is the torque that, um, that the water applies to the wheel, okay? All right, before, basically, we did the same problem, but it was force. But now we're considering the wheel as a solid object and considering its overall torque rather than just the force exerted on one, you know, one paddle. Okay, so here's the V1 and V2. Okay, so using Newton's second law, this form, I'm zooming zoom on this a bit. So this form of Newton's second law, net torque equals delta L over delta T, so change in angular momentum over change in time. All right, we're going to have our change in angular momentum just be MR delta V. So because here we do need to consider the translational effect of the water. Okay, and so this would be, R would be relative to the pivot, which is the center of the water wheel. Okay, and then I'm just going to pull out the M and the delta T because that is none other than our mass flow rate. So that ends up being a known quantity right there. All right, R is also known, that is our 2.1 meters. Okay, and then our delta V is just going to be the 7.2 minus 1.3 because V final is 7.2, um, 13, excuse me, 13 is the initial velocity. And so there we have that the torque on the wheel Oh, this is, excuse me, this is the torque on the water. The torque on the water will be negative, and the torque on the wheel, according to Newton's third law, is just the negative of the torque on the water, and that will be positive, and that's gonna be positive in the direction that we're defining as counterclockwise, and it's 755 Newton meters, okay? So again, very similar idea to defining the force, but now we're finding the entire torque on the wheel, which does make more sense to approach this as a rotational system, okay? Okay? And then we're asked in part B, if the water causes the water wheel to make one revolution every 3.65 seconds, how much power is delivered to the water wheel? Well, here we're gonna use something from the last section in the uh, previous lecture, which is that power equals um, work over, uh, over change in time. In this case, work is expressed as torque times angular displacement. We already know the torque value because we solved for it through the definition of, um, or Newton's second law in angular momentum form. So we were able to find the torque and then we know that the displacement is a revolution, which is two pi radians, and we know that's happening every 3.65 seconds. All right, so there we have all our numbers, and so finally we get a power, a basically it's a power input of the water, it is the power output of the wheel, and it's 1300 watts. All right, and of course we could do something with that power, like grind something, or even turn that power into electricity if this is hooked up to a, um, a generator, okay? All right, and lastly, what is the rotational kinetic energy of the wheel? All right, well there, I'm just going to use another expression that we've seen in previous lectures, that rotational kinetic energy is one half I omega squared. We basically know everything here because we're gonna treat um, I as a cylinder, and that's a bit of an assumption, but we're gonna treat the, um, the water wheel as a perfect cylinder, so it has a moment of inertia of the form one half MR squared, which would have been stated in the problem if this was an exam problem, but here, as an example, I'm just assuming it. All right, there's the one half, just from the definition of kinetic energy. And then omega, we can go ahead and find because we know that the wheel is spinning at a constant rate. It's neither slowing down or speeding up. And so we're just going to use um, the circumference over the, over the time, right? And, and that's going to be, and it's actually not the circumference, it's just gonna be the, ra the radial displacement. If this was V, this would have to be two pi R over, over the period T. But in this case, since it's omega, it's the angular velocity, it's just two pi radians over T.
because right? this will give us radians per second, and we have to square it because after all we're solving for rotational kinetic energy. And there we go. The rotational kinetic energy of the wheel is about three, almost 4,000 or 3,920 joules. Okay, cool. Now this is a concept question, it doesn't have any numbers, but it's a great demonstration. So someone can stand on, like, on a swiveling chair, so the idea is that this chair is free to swivel. It's not currently swiveling. And they hold a bicycle wheel, and it helps that the bicycle wheel is filled with, like, with lead or something to make it much um, heavier and denser than it would than a normal bicycle wheel. And it's spinning as quickly as possible, as fast as you can get it spinning, and the person holds it directly upright. And so that, that means that the axis of rotation is like this. It also means that the angular velocity from the right hand rule, it's a curve, curl the fingers of your right hand, the angular velocity must point up. Well, if the angular velocity points up, then L, which is just I omega, must also point up. Because angular velocity, just like translation, uh, angular momentum that is, just like translational momentum, is always parallel to angular velocity. Just like translational momentum is always parallel to velocity. All right? So that means the L vector must point up. But here's the thing. What if this person exerts an internal torque on the person, chair, bicycle wheel system and flips that wheel upside down? Well, momentum must be conserved for the system, which means something else is going to have to start spinning to compensate for the change in momentum of the wheel. And the thing that starts spinning? The person themselves. Well, the person and the chair. Okay? All right, so let's see how that, how that works out. So the wheel is turned upside down. It changes its angular momentum from L to negative L because angular momentum is a vector. And it goes from, again, think about the right-hand rule, it goes from pointing up to pointing down, okay? When the wheel is, is, is flipped upside down. And thus the person in chair must acquire 2L for the angular momentum to be conserved, okay? So kind of in a pictorial format, it would look like this. Here is the initial angular momentum. So the entire initial angular momentum is just that single L pointing up. When they, when they flip it upside down, now you've got an L pointing down. Well, that's that's... You know, that is 2L different from the initial L, which means that to compensate for that change of, of 2L, that net change of 2L, the person has to pick up an upward 2L. In equation form, it looks like this. L initial equals L final. L initial is just L. The, the final angular momentum of the wheel on itself is negative L, which means we need another 2L, because together, negative L plus 2L just gives us L which was the angular momentum we started with, which, which has to be conserved because there were no external torques in the system. There was, of course, a torque to twist the wheel, but it was internal, okay? And this is a demonstration that works reliably, right? This is a, and it's, it's neat because you don't expect it, okay? But then, but the physics helps explain it. All right, so let's go into our next type of problem, spinning objects colliding, colliding in a perfectly inelastic manner. So a spinning turntable with a mass of 24.5 kilograms and constant angular velocity of 19 radians per second has a rod of uniform density with mass 5.52 kilograms dropped right on top of it. The rod lands in such a way that it lands so its center lines up with the center of the turntable and sticks upon contact. Ah, perfectly inelastic collision. Both objects have diameter or length, right, because it's diameter for the um, turntable, it's length for the rod, but they both have the same and it's two meters. All right, so in the picture, this is what it looks like. All right, so here's our two meter rod. There's our L, okay? This is our uh, two meter diameter turntable, and we're dropping the rod. It lands right on top, directly on top, and then they start spinning together as one, okay? So the question is, what is the final angular velocity of this new combined object, okay? Because we, it, we know it's initial angular velocity. We just need to find the final, okay? All right, so this is kind of like the ice skater, but this conservation of angular momentum, instead of being driven by just changing the moment of inertia i, instead is driven by a collision. But the effect is kind of similar, because what we're doing is we're changing the moment of inertia i. Because the rod came in on, at rest. We could have brought the rod in with its own spin. We could have brought it in, you know, spinning in some direction, but we didn't. We just dropped it down so the rod had no initial spin. So the initial um, angular uh, momentum well, I should say the initial moment of inertia was just that of a disk. It was one half mR squared. After the rod lands on top and this combined object, rod plus disk, is spinning as one, it's one half mR squared plus one twelfth ml squared. All right? Now remember, the numerical value of R and L are the same. They're both two meters. But where does this one twelfth ml squared come from? It comes from tables of common moments of inertia, and it's the moment of inertia of a rod about its center. About center. All right? And that would be I of rod about center, okay? 1 12th ml squared. And if that sounds not like the moment of inertia we used for rods before, that's because you're probably remembering the one that is 1 3rd ml squared. Well, 1 3rd ml squared is a rod pivoted about 1 in. 
and it makes sense that the moment of inertia of a rod pivoted about its end is greater than a rod pivoted about its center, because what's is harder to turn? Hold a pencil. If you hold it at its very end, it's kind of hard to get it to rotate up and down. If you hold it in its middle, it's really easy to get it to rotate up back and forth, right? Because it has less moment of inertia, a smaller moment of inertia when it is pivoting about its center, hence the 1 12th as its leading coefficient, okay? But that's the final total moment of inertia of this combined object, okay? Of course, we're just gonna start with L equals L, L um, prime, right? L initial equals L final. All right, so then we're just going to express what those two um, angular momentums are. All right, so the initial angular momentum is just I omega, where I is just the angular of the moment of inertia of the turntable. Omega is given, it's a 19. Um, the final moment of inertia is I total, um, which is just this right here. And then this is what we're solving for, the final angular velocity. Okay, so there we are, we're just solving for final angular velocity. Let's plug in our numbers. All right, so then this is just the moment of inertia of the disk. This is the initial angular velocity. This is the new combined moment of inertia. And when we plug in all the numbers here, we get 16.5. So this is slowed down. Of course it's slowed down because now it's got more to rotate. If it's got more inertia, more mass to rotate, it's got to slow down because momentum is conserved. Okay? All right. And then finally, how much energy is lost during this fully inelastic collision? And fully, by the way, is just a synonym of perfectly. Perfectly inelastically, or perfectly inelastic and fully inelastic mean the same thing. All right, so we're just gonna take K initial minus K final. So the initial kinetic energy is just the kinetic energy of the, um, of the turntable or disc. And then the final kinetic energy would be one half I total times omega prime squared. And we know omega prime now, all right? And we always knew I total because it was just this expression right here. Okay, all right, so let's plug everything in. That's all I've done here. All right, so this is the initial kinetic energy minus the final kinetic energy, and I'm counting out being smaller, and of course it will be, because energy, energy is always lost in inelastic collisions. And there we go, a fairly significant 289 joules, right? Even just for, you know, not, not giant objects like this, right? Although the turntable is pretty large at 24 kilograms. That's a hefty turntable, right? It's like a big potter's wheel or something. All right, so that's one type of collision, a purely rotational collision, all right? So now look, let's look at two collisions that aren't purely rotational. They're a combination of a translational object colliding with a rotating object. So first one, a spherical space station. It's kind of a neat example. I like anything that takes place in space. All right, here's the picture, by the way. All right, here's our, our spherical space stations. Think like the Death Star. All right, and an asteroid is crashing into it. Okay, so let's read the details here. A spherical space station of mass 2.8 times 10 to the 7 kilograms, so 28 million kilograms, rated because, you know, this house is a bunch of people. The radius is 258 meters, and the moment of inertia is that of a sphere, 2 fifths mr squared. So it's treated like a solid sphere. It's struck tangentially by a small asteroid of mass 150 kilograms, all right, and that asteroid was traveling at 35,000 meters per second, so 3.5 times 10 to the 4 meters per second. Okay, and it's, it crashes in at the, station, the station's equator, which means that the distance from the impact is the radius of the space station, the spherical space station. Um, and also the fact that it crashes in tangentially means that the velocity is exactly perpendicular to the radius. So we don't have to worry about taking a component of the velocity. We can just use it, its whole magnitude. Okay, um, and it, it gets embedded in the side of the space station. Okay, which means afterwards it's going to contribute to the overall moment of, the, moment of inertia of the space station, although it's going to change it a very small amount because it's so it has so little mass okay and prior to the collision the space station had a constant angular velocity of 0.55 radians per second okay so using conservation of angular momentum what is the final angular velocity of the space station with the embedded asteroid because the idea is that since the space station is crashing in a way that it is its velocity is par is parallel into the instantaneous tangential velocity of the perimeter itself based on the the fact that the space station is spinning counterclockwise, we should expect the space station to speed up, right? And that would be contrast to if, this, if the asteroid came in the other way and crashed this way, then the, the, the collision and the embedding of the asteroid would slightly slow the space station down. But in this case, it should speed it up. Although there are two competing effects. The actual, the actual conservation of um, angular momentum is going to speed it up a little bit because this some of the translational momentum of the asteroid is going to get imparted to the angular momentum of the rotating space station. And, but then at the same time, the added mass at the perimeter is going to increase the moment of inertia of the system, and that would kind of slow it down. But since the mass is so small, that's going to have a really small effect. Although you're going to see that the change actually isn't going to be that big to begin with. Okay? So we're going to use L equals L prime, which we do basically in all of these problems, all right, except for, say, like the water wheel problem. 
okay? And that one, we're just using the, de the relationship between torque and change in angular momentum, all right? But this one, there's, there's no external torques. Everything's internal to the system. The system is the asteroid and space station. And then we're going to note that the initial angular momentum of the asteroid is MVR because we're, we're considering that it has angular momentum relative to the pivot point, which is the center of the sphere, okay? So here we have our conservation equation, okay? Because initially we've got the uh, angular momentum of the, station, of the space station, I omega, and we've got the angular momentum of the asteroid, right? Which is PR, which is PR is the same as MVR, okay? And, and that's, that's the new idea here. We're not used to having two terms in the examples we've seen so far, okay? So we start with two angular momentums. Afterwards, we just have a single angular momentum because now there's just one object that's rotating and it's rotating as a solid object. Okay, so there's no MVR term. Okay, so then we plug in everything we know. Okay, so we know that the moment of inertia of the space station, two fifths MR squared. We know omega, that was the 0.55. All right, we know M, V, and R. All right, and we have that's just because, you know, that's just the mass of the asteroid, velocity of the asteroid, radius of the space station, and it's radius, radius of the space station because that's where the collision occurs. Okay, um, and then we've got the final total uh, moment of inertia of the system, which is just the space station plus the small contribution of the asteroid. Notice that the asteroid has a moment of inertia like a simple pendulum. That makes sense because effectively the asteroid is a particle. So all of its mass is, is located a full distance of one, one space station radius away from the center. And then we've got the final angular velocity, the thing we're going to solve for, omega prime. Okay, so we just solve for it, isolate omega prime, plug in all the numbers. Okay, and what do we get? There it is, 0.552 radians per second. Oh, yeah, not a big difference. It sped up in the hundredths place, right? It increased by like less than 1%, right? So it's a very, very small increase. All right, we could, we could have had the asteroid bigger or faster and that would have changed the numbers a bit, but this kind of realistic case is it wouldn't be a big difference. It wouldn't even be that perceptible. There might be a, a, no, a probably more likely there'd be a, a notice of an initial jolt because of the fact that there'd have to be you know, some rapid deceleration of the asteroid, but the actual permanent effect of changing the rotation rate of the space station, yeah, not much. Okay, all right, let's do one more kind of similar problem of a translating object crashing, crashing into a rotating object. All right, so here it is. It's a bullet crashing into a board. So a light uniform density rod is free to pivot about its center. It has a moment of inertia of 112 ml, 112, 1 over 12 ml, ml squared, Okay, and that's this object right here. So the object doesn't start rotating, unlike the space station, but this is very much a rota rotational object because it has, it has a pivot point. It's, it's, you know, it's capable of spinning. It just happens to be at rest when the collision occurs. And what's the collision? Well, here it is. The rod is initially vertical and balanced at rest. Okay, so it's in an unstable equilibrium. It has a mass of 440 grams and a length of what's called 2b, and that's based on this, this uh, measurement in the figure. So its overall length is 2b uh, of 2.2 meters, okay? which means B is 1.1 meter, of course. A bullet with a mass of 45 grams, so obviously less massive than the board, traveling at 65 meters per second, which is pretty slow for a bullet, collides with the rod at a distance of 43 centimeters above the pivot. So it collides right here, and that's the D value. So D is 43 centimeters. And remember that this, that's about halfway up, but not quite, because this, this is 110 centimeters, all right, B is, and so 43 is a little bit less than half, half the way from the pivot to the tip, okay? And embeds on the upper half is shown. All right, so the question is, what is the angular velocity of the rod with embedded bullet after the instant after the collision? Okay, because the system definitely won't remain at rest. It's going to have to start moving. So we're going to have a, a more substantial change than we saw for the space station, All right? But it's the same approach, very much the same approach. Angular momentum is conserved during the collision. We're going to use L equals L prime, and the initial angular momentum is entirely that of the bullet. Okay, because since the rod is at rest, the only angular momentum is the translational momentum, which is kind of odd, but it's fine because at the moment of the collision, the bullet has angular momentum relative to the pivot of m d, because that, that's, the, that's the moment arm, velocity times sine of 90. All right, I just decided to include the sine of 90 to really finally call attention or, you know, call attention one last time to the fact that since here the velocity is perpendicular to the radius, we don't have to worry about taking a component because sine of 90 is just one which is just telling us that the angular momentum of the bullet is just MVR, but of course here, R is D, okay? And this is just adding, adding some details to the figure itself, pointing out that this is L, which is twice B, and then showing that the center of mass after the collision will not be located at the pivot. Why is that? Well, because after the bullet becomes embedded in the board, that's gonna pull the center of mass slightly towards the bullet. 
Okay? All right? And we'll find out exactly how much by just using the center mass equation. Okay? And we're going to need that for part B. All right? So, and this is, this is points out that the velocity is perpendicular to the rod, right? As shown in the figure. All right? So then using uh, conservation of angular momentum, MVD, which is the initial angular momentum of the system, then is going to be equal to the final angular momentum of the system, which is just the total moment of inertia, which is the moment of inertia of the rod rotated about its center, plus the moment of inertia of the embedded bullet. Again, right? Looks like a hoop or looks like a simple pendulum. That's because it is. Okay? And then times the final angular velocity, omega prime. And what are we solving for? The same thing we basically do in all these problems, we solve for omega prime. The final angular velocity. Right? This is pointing out that I totals is the sum of the two moments of inertia. All right. All right. So then the final angular velocity is just MVD over 1 12th ml squared plus MD squared. All right. Plug in our numbers. And there we go. We find that the final angular velocity of the rod with embedded bullet is 6.77 radians per second, significantly more than what it was when it started because it started at rest. All right. And now it's going to start spinning. At this point, the rod is just going to keep, keep spinning around. But here's the thing. It's not going to spin at a constant rate because what's going to happen is since its, its center of mass is slightly shifted up from the pivot, and it ends up being you know, enough so that there is a measurable difference. It's gonna, as it spins, it will keep spinning. It has enough energy to spin all the way through over and over again. And if there's no, if there's no loss of energy to a non-conservative force, it'll just spin forever. But it's always going to spin slightly faster at the bottom. Why is that? Well, because what happens is the gravitational potential energy that it has when it's vertical, immediately after the collision, will always get used up into rotational kinetic energy when this center of mass gets brought down below the pivot, and then that, that extra speed then will get returned and it'll slightly slow down. So it's gonna spin, but it'll spin, it'll, if you're paying close attention, you'd see it slow down, or you see it speed up a little bottom, slow down, and then speed up, and then slow down over and over again, okay? And that's what we're gonna find in part B. What is the translational velocity of the bottom end of the rod after it swung half of revolution after the collision? Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find the angular velocity of the rod as a whole when it has made that half turn, that pi radian rotation, a half revolution. All right, and we're going to do that. We don't have to worry about angular momentum at all, although we're going to use the information that we found from using angular momentum. But for part B, we're just going to use conservation of rotational energy. So it's a throwback to the last lecture. All right, so we need to find um, H com. So then we can use conservation of energy. All right. And so we're, we're going to use conservation of energy, but let's find the h com. h com is just going to be md over total mass, all right? And this is just the idea of x com, right, being, you know, m1 times x plus m2 times x2, that would be x1, all over m1 plus m2. That's all I'm using. It's just that big M is located at zero, the point that I'm calling zero. So big M doesn't show up in the denominator. Only little m does, where little m is the mass of the bullet, and the d is just the distance from the origin, which we're calling the pivot point. Okay? So the center of mass is not located at the, at, the, at the pivot, and this is how far the center of mass is from the pivot, which is shown in the figure. Okay? So when you solve for it, it ends up being about 4 centimeters, or about one-tenth of um, B. So not quite drawn to scale, but almost drawn to scale in the figure. Okay? All right, so with that information, then we can go on to conservation of energy. So we're going to have the total mechanical energy immediately after the collision, and then the energy after half a revolution. All right, so immediately after the collision, there is a certain amount of kinetic energy, and there's also gravitational potential energy because the center of mass is above the pivot point. Afterwards, there is going to be only kinetic energy because we're going to, we're going to refer to the fact that what's going to happen is then there's going to be the, that center of mass is going to come down and we're going to lose all of that energy. All right. So then we're just going to set up our conservation equation like so. Okay. And then we just do, just combine a bunch of terms. You can check the algebra yourself. All right, plug in all the numbers. It's quite a big, it doesn't have to be this big, but I kept it entirely symbolic. And by the way, I mean, all I did here, this, I know this looks like a lot going on in this here, but that's because I didn't, I didn't enter anything numerically. I easily could have, right? I total is just a number after all. I didn't have to express it in terms of all the variables, but I did, which does make it look particularly clunky, but it doesn't have to be so, right? Many of these are just numbers. These are all known numbers, okay? In fact, all of them are, right? The only single unknown is going to be omega final, which is the velocity at the bottom of the swing. And so when we do that, we find it 6.92. It is faster. Of course it is, because we lost that gravitational potential energy and it had to go somewhere. It went to kinetic energy. But I'm not done, because I didn't ask for the, the uh, rotational velocity of the 
the rod or of the board with embedded rod, I guess, of the rod with embedded bullet, I asked for the translational velocity of the bottom end. So we want this velocity right there after half a revolution. All right. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, we just relate rotational velocity to translational velocity using this familiar expression. That velocity, v tip in this case, is just omega, omega final, because that describes the object as a whole, times b. Why b? Because b would be the distance from the pivot to the point we care about, the end of the rod. That's b. Okay? All right, so there we go. We just take 6.92, multiply by 1.1, because that's the value of b, and there is our translational velocity of the tip of the rod after it has swung halfway down following the collision of the bullet. All right, a perfectly inelastic collision because the bullet was embedded in there. But anyway, so that final velocity is 7.61 meters per second. All right. Okay, so that, that wraps things up, wraps up our last of our angular momentum examples, wraps up the last of all the ideas, the many ideas related to rotational physics. Okay, well, I hope it's been interesting. Thank you so much for watching.